charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for grace. Lord, thank you so much for Calvary. Lord, what you did there so that we would have forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And Father, I pray if there's one or uh, any number of people this morning that are trusting in their own works or their religious activities or anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would awaken them to their need today, that they would see that only Jesus can save them from their sins and that they must come to Christ and put their faith and trust in Christ. And Father, I pray for those who are saved that you would help them to be mindful uh, that, Lord, we are to continue to pursue Christ. Lord, that we are to diligently add to our faith. And Lord, help us to grow. And Lord, to learn more about you. But Lord, we want to live a life before you that brings you the greatest glory. And we pray, God, that you'd instruct us on how to do that today. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Verse 10 ends with that statement, the title of our sermon today, that you shall never fall. Throughout the scriptures, we're warned about the forces that are constantly fighting against us. I hope that you're mindful of that. You need to be mindful of that. This morning, even in Sunday school, we were once again reminded in 1 Peter chapter 5 about Satan as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And Peter instructed us to be sober and alert and aware of the danger that we are in presently. We're in a battle. We're in a war. We're called to be soldiers. And as you look into the Scriptures, you'll see that some did not continue to follow after God. Some tripped up or stumbled. Some gave up, right? And others turned back. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul writes to some believers that are having a difficult time, and he says this in Galatians 5 and verse 7, Ye did run well. You did. There was a time that you were living for Christ, that you were believing the truth, that you were doing well when it comes to your Christian life and your Christian race. And then he adds, Who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? Who caused you to not continue on that race? How did you stumble? Who was it that interfered? I've looked, and as I've tried to minister and help people through the years, I've seen some who are doing extremely well after they put their faith and trust in Christ. And I was so happy and pleased. And then I saw them start to make some mistakes. And I tried to warn them. And some of them went on in the way of the world. And today are even in the world still, having lost their children to this world. Yesterday I was up here working at the church and I noticed a, a white four-door car parked up near the front. And it didn't appear like anybody was in there. And so as I drove up closer to it on the lawnmower, I noticed the window was cracked and there was a single gentleman sitting in there. And so I stopped and turned the lawnmower off and I said, is there anything I can do to help you? And he said, no, I'm just uh, <clears throat> waiting on someone to come by. And I said, well, well it's nice to meet you. And then I asked him, I said, by the way, are you attending church anywhere? That's usually my way of getting in to talk about spiritual matters. And he said, no. Uh, when I was young, I used to go to church all the time. And uh, we were faithful in attendance. He said, but now I got the old ball and chain. Now, who was he referring to? 
Oh, really? I didn't know. I didn't know what he was referring to. Because my wife is not the old ball and chain. <laughs> She's a blessing to me. <laughs> and uh, and so he said, I got to work, and I work all the time. I said, don't forget, the Bible says this in Matthew chapter six, verse thirty-three. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I said, you've got you've got it backwards. You've gone after money, and then more money, and then when you make more money, you need more money, and it's, an, it's a rat race. It, 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 it leads you further and further away from your genuine relationship with Christ. And afterwards, he had sat out here a while until I finished up, and he walked up to me, and he said, I want to give you this for the church, an offering. And he said, I appreciate the conversation that you had with me and your hospitality. But sadly, his story can be told over and over and over again, especially in our day. When people were raised right, they were raised in church, but they get up and they get a job. And then that job starts requiring their Sunday attendance at the job. And then next thing you know, they're just mindful of work and the world and finances and they're consumed with those finances instead of continuing to run for Christ they have stumbled they're not involved in serving Jesus they're not faithful to Christ they're not loving the Lord as he ought to be loved right you see this throughout the Bible as well one of the most shocking evidences of this or persons is Gehazi in 2 Kings chapter 5. Remember, Naaman had went to go and see the prophet because a little maid said, if you go see the prophet, you'll be healed of the leprosy. And when Naaman came to see Elisha, he brought great gifts. He brought silver and gold and ten changes of apparel, which must have been costly, right? He said, Elisha, after his healing... Let me give you some of these things. And Elisha said, no, I'm not interested in that. I don't want payment. Later on, when he had gotten away from Elisha, Gehazi runs after him and says, listen, we've got two prophets that just come in. And they need some, they need some money. And they need a change of clothes. And Naaman said, well, here, uh, you know, take... Uh, take a double of what you're asking. Here's the garments that you're asking for. And Gehazi just did it for greed. No prophet had come. He just wanted to put those things in his own pockets. He gets back to Elisha. Read it later on when you have a chance. And Elisha said, Gehazi, you've made the worst decision you've ever made in your life. You're a little bit wealthier, but the leprosy that Naaman has is now going to be on you, and listen, and on your family. Gehazi fell. He went back. He walked away for financial profit or gain. We read of Demas in the New Testament as well. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, we see Demas is a co-worker. He's serving right alongside the Apostle Paul, and then we just see his name. He's not doing much anymore. And then when Paul writes his last letter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he mentions Demas in verse 10, and he says this, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica. Demas is no longer preaching with us. He's no longer teaching with us. He's no longer working for Christ. He is... Gone. He is in love with the world. He is after the things of this world. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes this about individuals in his day. He says in verses 18 through 20, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Verse 19, Holding faith, and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith hath made shipwrecked. They were selling out on the sea of faith, and because they didn't hold to the word of God, belief in the things of God, they turned away from God's word and God's son. They were shipwrecked. 
He goes on to say in verse 20, Of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So some in the Bible have tripped up. Some of those had given up. And some even turned their back. But the Bible says here in 2 Peter chapter 1 that if we do these things, we would never stumble. We would never fall. Uh, we, we don't have to be a part of those that turn away from Christ, do we? Mm-hmm. By the way, the Bible said one of the evidences of the coming of Christ in the book of Thessalonians, one of the ways that you'll know Jesus is coming soon, in 2 Thessalonians 2, he said that there'll be a great falling away first. Amen. I mean, some churches that used to preach doctrinally sound sermons will no longer preach doctrinally sound sermons. Paul said they won't even endure sound doctrine in those days. And we are living in those days. Some of the great denominations of a few years past that were solid and stood for Christ have just crumbled under the pressure of this world wanting them to compromise. The Episcopal Church, the first church in America that openly endorsed a gay bishop. A bishop is the overseer of other Episcopal churches. I, I, I'll be honest with you, if I was a member in an Episcopal church, I would be a member no longer. Amen. So if y'all going to agree with this and endorse this, I am not going to be a part of that. I, I'll find another group of people that's not going to say abomination is okay. Right. But it didn't stop there. Other churches begin to embrace it. They don't want to feel like they're against the world and the trends of the world. They, they don't want to seem like they're uncompromising and so they're unwilling to say sin is sin. Wrong is wrong. Evil is evil. What God forbids, God will always forbid. So the Methodists joined in. The United Church of Christ joined in and many other denominations are not taking a firm stand against the sin of homosexuality. And there has been a great falling away. Is that true or not? And I hope that at least you would recognize that. So in the last days, there will be many that will turn away from sound doctrine. Would you be a part of that group? There will be many that will compromise with the world. Would you be a part of that group? There will be many who will not stand on the teachings of Christ. Will you be a part of that group? Or will you be a part of the group that never falls? Well, here's some lessons how we can keep from never falling. First of all, by believing in His divine promises. By believing in God's divine promises. I hope that you notice as we read in uh, 2 Peter chapter number 1, he says in verse 4, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious Promises, and he'll and he'll go on to say, because of this, we have eternal life. We have a right relationship with uh, Christ, and then we're to add to this with all diligence and continue to grow and increase our knowledge of Christ. But it all begins first and foremost by believing the testimony of Scripture, by believing what God has said to us in the Holy Bible. And by the way, that's why the Bible is under attack like never before. And don't make any mistake about it, it is under severe attack. They continue to try to change what the Bible says, corrupt what the Bible says, adjust to fit in uh, today's popular view what the Bible says. But let me tell you something, the Bible will stand forever as the Word of God. It's an unchangeable book. Now you may change some words to try to fit it for your own denomination like Jehovah's Witnesses do. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, they change what the Bible says there because they don't accept the deity of Christ. Or you might be like others that tamper with the Word of God. But you will never change the truth of God's holy Word. His Word will stand... And by the way, I am so glad that I have a copy of the Bible in my hands. I believe the Bible. I believe every word of the Bible. I believe it's preserved. I believe God has given to us exactly what He wanted us to have in our hands. 
I trust the King James Version above any other version because many have said it's the most accurate version that's available. But, but in order to have this without falling life, there must first of all be a receiving of what God has said in His Word. If we believe the Word of God, we'll, we'll, we'll accept everything God has given to us. I believe it all. I believe that Noah built an ark and put those animals on that ark and it saved uh, what, what would survive the uh, flood only uh, was survived through that ark. I believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great well. You say, how, do you, how can you believe that, preacher? Because Jesus said, that's a sign that I'll give you of my, uh, the reality that I'm the Son of God. As Jonah was in the uh, well of the belly, belly of the well, <laughs> three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Just like that happened, I'm going to die and I'm going to raise again. He bore witness to it. How can we not accept it, right? And everything else the Bible says as well. When was Abraham declared righteous? When was Abraham declared righteous? Was he declared righteous when he left his home and was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God? Was he declared righteous when he was circumcised? And by keeping the law before the law, that's how God said, okay, now, right, Abraham, you're going to be righteous now. What does the Bible say? In Romans chapter 4, verse 3, For what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God. And I don't know what's going on in your, in your heart and mind when you come to the Bible, but, but I trust, I'm telling you, if you're never going to fall, you have to believe the Bible is the Word of God. Don't let Satan or the world confuse you about that truth. Romans 4 and verse 3 goes on to say, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham became righteous when he believed the testimony that God has given to us. Belief implies this, knowledge. Right? In order to believe something, you have to know it. You know, there's a lot of people in the world that have never even heard the simple, true story of how Jesus can save them from their sins. Do you know there are a lot of people living in America and who have attended churches that still have no idea what it means to be saved and put their faith and trust in Christ, multitudes upon multitudes. In fact, evangelist Billy Graham said the greatest mission field in America is the Baptist, local Baptist church. Do you believe that's true? I can tell you it's true. My father-in-law was a member of the Baptist church and became a deacon, and everybody thought that he was saved because he made a trip to the altar and in the altar, they asked him, how did you want to join the church? They didn't ask him, why did you come? Do you know Christ? They said, how do you want to join the church? By letter or by baptism? He wasn't a member of another church. But he knew his daddy wouldn't let him get baptized. And so he said, by letter. Didn't he know what it meant? They said, okay. Made him a member of their church. Never received a letter from another church. Made him a deacon. But all the while, he had never met Christ until one night in the floorboard of an old pickup truck trying to help somebody else with his relationship with Christ. He realized that he needed Jesus himself. And he stopped praying for that man. He said, Lord, save me. Save me. And that night, he was a transformed man. But a multitude had come to church, shook the preacher's hand, and because they shook a man's hand, they think they're going to go to heaven when they die. How can we sit in churches and the gospels preached over and over again and even believe that anything like that represents what the Bible says about salvation? To believe means you have to know. What does the Bible teach? And by the way, the Bible says this, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. If you're unsaved, the best thing you can do is spend time reading the Scriptures. If you're saved, one of the best things you can do is spend time reading, to, reading the Scriptures. Amen? But it also implies not only knowledge, but it implies trust as well. 
If I believe it, I'm going to act on it. I'm going to step out. I'm going to attempt to do what the Bible tells me to do, right? You know the reason I tithe? And I'm not saying this about giving. I'm not picking on giving. But the reason I personally tithe is because what the Bible teaches about tithe. You say, preacher, does tithing make you wealthy? No, it doesn't make you wealthy. But tithing is one way I can say, Lord, I believe you and I trust you. I trust you with my family's care and our finances. And I believe if I honor you, you will take care of us. And can I testify this morning? He's always, always, always met our needs. And and listen to me, and he always will. I know the Lord's promises are true. Believing means that you trust in those promises. I One night I knelt in an altar and put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and He changed my life. And only Jesus can do that. Amen? It also believes or implies obedience. If I believe what the Bible says, I have to know what it says, and then there's a, the trusting. I believe that God's going to be honest with me. He loves me. He's not going to lie to me. And then it implies also a step of obedience in that direction where I'm willing to do whatever Christ tells me that I ought to do. In our song book, we have uh, this song, The Solid Rock, page 419. It says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? I know that I have a home in heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done. Not anything I've ever done, only through the work of Christ on the cross do I know that I have eternal life. And by the way, there are some people that have faith, but it's the faith that the Bible condemns. It's a faith that has no obedience. Remember that? Is that what James 2 is writing about? A faith that's a dead faith? It's a faith that just makes a claim, a verbal claim... Oh, I believe this, but there's no conduct to back up that claim. If you were to follow that life and video record its actions and words, you would not see Christ in that life at all until maybe they came to church and started singing the songs that were called out in the assembly. Can I, can I tell you something? If that's as far as your Christianity goes, you better question yourself whether or not you've ever met Jesus. Amen? Because Jesus comes to live within. (laughs) It's 24-7. Amen? He's always with us. And we may not always do what's pleasing to Him, but we will always be mindful of Him because He's given us of His Holy Spirit. That brings me to our second point. By receiving His divine nature. How can we never fall? The reason I mention these first two steps is because there's a lot of people who believe... And it's just head knowledge, right? They say, oh, I know that. You can't tell me anything about the Bible that I don't know. And by the way, those are the ones that scare me the most. The one that has so much head knowledge, but they never have met Jesus. He's never changed their heart. So it's not just by believing His divine record, what He said, and the promises that He's given us, but it's also by receiving a divine nature. Something changes in people that meet Jesus as their Savior. When they they accept Christ, they're a completely different person. Outside they look the same, but on the inside, all things are new. Amen? Amen. And the Bible testifies to the truth of that, right? You can see that divine nature in at least two ways. By the new birth. By the new birth. In John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5, Jesus said... You must be born again. You must be born again. When you repent of your sins and receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, as your Savior, at that very moment, you are born again, born from above, born by the Spirit of God, birth into the family of God. Listen to me. Not before that moment. Amen? In other words, you're not born in this world born again. We're all born lost, hell-bound sinners with an Adamic nature, the nature of Adam, a selfish, sinful nature, right? 
And, and, and the reason I mention that, some try to teach that there's certain elect people that they're born again and they're saved just when they come to the knowledge of that. But that's not according to the Bible. It's Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, who in all accounts was born again at some time after this conversation, right? Because Nicodemus was a follower of Christ, the Bible says. Amen? And Nicodemus was religious and devout. He went to the Sabbath every Saturday, but he was not saved. But it also applies not after that moment either. In other words, the new birth only happens one time. You're not saved, and then saved again, and then saved again, and then some down, some down the road, you're saved again. The physical birth happens one time, right? Please don't tell me you believe in reincarnation, because that's not true. <laughs> the Bible says it's once appointed unto man to die, and after this, the judgment. Once. We're going to die once. What we're born into this world one time. If you went and asked someone, how many times have you been physically born? They said, I don't know. I mean, I've been born physically a lot of times. I mean, when I was like four, I prayed with mom and dad. And when I was eight, and, and when you talk to people about their conversion and salvation, how many of you realize that's, that's what some people say? Uh, when, were you sa uh, when were you saved? Oh, I, I've been saved a lot of times. Anybody ever told you that? Were you truly born again one time? And you ought to cherish that new birth. And at that moment, God takes that dead spirit that we receive from Adam and He brings life into it and His spirit comes and indwells us and we're made spiritually alive. And when we're made spiritually alive, that means we've received the divine nature. That means that we have a new heart and a new spirit because of that new birth, right? When I was saved, God changed my desires. My want to. Before I was saved, I wanted sin. I wanted the world. I wanted the things of this world. But the night I met Jesus as my Savior and Lord, He changed my desires. I wanted Christ. I wanted church. I wanted preaching. I wanted the Word of God. Only Jesus can change our hearts. Amen? The new birth also... or that new nature is revealed by that new spirit that we have received... Titus says this in Titus 3, five, Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to His mercy He saved us, listen, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that good? Amen. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen? Amen? And when we're born again, we notice there's a new spirit in us. That's, that, that is the Holy Ghost of God. Romans 8.10 says this, And if, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Over and over in Romans and other places, he said the spirit of God has come to live in your heart. Christ lives in you. And if Christ is in us, then the world is going to see a different you. Amen? But not only just by be believing in the promises or receiving this divine nature, but by pursuing His divine commands. Notice, Peter doesn't stop there when he says, will you receive the divine nature? Good luck. No, he adds to that, verse 5. He says, and besides this, and what he's saying when he says, and I, I encourage you to study this out, and besides this, he said, based on this, because these things are true, you, you're, you're not who you were. You believe God's promises. You've received this divine nature. Based on this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. And then he gives a list of stuff that you and I can work on. Amen? Amen. Virtue. Moral excellence. Now, I trust that you, are, you have high morals. If you're here, you're saved. I hope that you have high morals. But I just want to ask you a question. 
Could you be more morally virtuous? Could you grow in that area of your life? I have to say, even my own self, yes. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Listen, this is the knowledge that is not just information. Let's, let's do just a few more moments and we'll close. It's not information, it's experience. You know what a lot of Christians are missing? The knowledge and experience. Experiences with Christ. Where Christ does something in your life. Where He changes you. He answers a prayer. He makes something different inside. The last time they had any experience or knowledge of Christ is when they were born again. And then, they, and then they're wondering, is that all there is to Christianity? No. Because there's a lot more that Christ will do to you and in you and for you, for His glory, if you'll continue to pursue Christ and be obedient to His teachings and His Word. Amen? I share this testimony with you just because I hope that it helps you. I was struggling with a sin. I knew what I was doing was wrong. And uh, I was trying to stop it. And it just kept getting more intense and intense and intense. And I was reading in the book of Hebrews chapter number 4 that we have a high priest that is touched with the feelings of our infirmities because he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. I said, Lord. I got on my knees. I said, Lord, this is the weakness of mine. This is an infirmity. It's always, it was, it was a weakness before I got saved. And it's renewed. It's stirred. It's a weakness. I can't, I can't overcome it. But you can. Yes. You were tempted at all points. Yes. And you won every battle. Yes. And I'm just asking you for mercy and grace to help me. To help me. Now listen to me. When I rose from that prayer time, He gave me victory. Amen. The intensity of that pressure to, to yield to that temptation was completely gone. Praise God. Praise God. He removed it absolutely. Hallelujah. I experienced Christ when I was saved. But let me tell you something. I also experienced Christ in that time of need. Yes. Yes. And by the way, that's what Christ... He's the living Savior. He didn't die and was buried and He's still there. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And He wants to be working in your life. But so often, we're not letting Him work like He desires to work. We're not expecting Him to work like He promised that He would work. Amen? That's your faith, virtue, and virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, temperance, or self-control, patience. Not patience as waiting for an appointment time is past it two hours. This is crazy. And usually what's happening about that time, Brendan's tapping me on the leg. A little bit longer. A little bit longer. We've been sitting here two hours. They ain't doing nothing. Be patient. A little bit longer. And about the time I get to walk out, they say, all right, this time. <laughs> I think they time it where you just not that patience the impatience to do this continue to trust in Christ when everything around you is falling apart you lose a loved one and then something else happens and then another tragedy hits you right in the face at that same time and when someone says hey when it rains it pours and you say I know what you're talking about it's pouring now but Jesus loves me and he's with me and he'll help me and I know he's here Patience to endure whatever trials that come your way. He said, if you'll do these things, you'll never fall. Amen? Amen. By the way, when we're working on those things, what are we doing? <laughs> we're engaged with Christ. Aren't we? Because we say, Lord, I, I need more. How to be, I need to be more morally pure. You're the only one that was perfect in your morality. Virtue. Excellent. Help me. And then we read the Word of God and He points out something. You know what? My yea is not yea and my nay is not nay. I say some things sometimes and then I don't follow through and do it. That's a bad testimony. Isn't it? That's not moral excellence, is it? That, that would need to change, wouldn't it? 
A- absolutely. And he points that out to me in his word. And he pricks my heart about it. And then he'll press it on me until I say, Lord, help me. Help me to change in this area. We're engaged with Christ when we're trying to diligently add to our... Listen, giving all diligence. We're also engaged with the Word of God. We read it and we find, hey, this is, this is true. This is sin. This is right. This is wrong. And we're engaged with spiritual transformation as well. If we're adding these things to our... Listen, if we're adding these things to our life, what's going to happen? We're going to be growing, growing, growing spiritually, right? You, you'll have passion for Christ. You'll be on fire for God. You'll be eager to tell lost people about Jesus. You'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in your knowledge of Christ. Amen? I don't know about you. I don't want to even stumble. I'm glad Proverbs said a righteous man stumbles, falls seven times, and gets back up. Aren't you? Sometimes I think, you know, like the cat they say has nine lives. I think I'm on life number 13 or something. But listen, you can live a life that pleases God. You can. Believe His promises. Make certain that you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside. But by the way, if you don't have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you, there's no way to add to your faith. You have to have genuine faith to start with. Amen? You can try to be more virtuous, more temperate, more loving. It's not going to help you until you're born again. Amen? But after that, there's a lot that we have to work on. A lot that we have to work on. Amen? And so let's let Jesus change us. And let's please the Lord with our life. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. Would you come to Christ? Because only Jesus can make you a new person. Amen? Amen. And if you are saved, where is the giving of all diligence? Are you pursuing Christ with a passionate heart? Are you adding to your faith? Are you working on becoming more like Christ? And if you're not, you're already in trouble. Amen? How about renewing that commitment this morning? Say, Jesus, help me to pick up that pace again and put my eyes on you. Change me and make me more like yourself. Would you do that today? Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word.